Sup, Squirt? I'm Leon, the Paperback Maniac, coming at you with another Vintage Horror Book Review. Today, we are taking a look at Andy by Bradley Snow. This book was published by Down Home Publishing, Incorporated, in 1990. And uh, this has got to be one of the earliest self-published horror novels that I know. Uh, Down Home Publishing uh, was a publishing house created by the author. And uh, according to my research, uh, they put out uh, no other books, you know, other than this one. Um, now, right off the bat, I got to give mad props to Bradley Snow, actually. Not only for creating his own publishing house, which, you know, uh, most likely was due to just uh, frustration uh, from, you know, not being published by any of the midlist uh, imprints of the time, but also for just the sheer sort of effort and, uh, you know, creativity that went into this thing. So, you know, not only do we have some awesome cover art there, uh, courtesy of um, Rod Snow, whom I'm guessing is a relative of the author, but uh, also just some rad illustrations throughout, uh, brought to us by Rod Snow and also John Mercer. And I will show you guys some of those illustrations as we go through the review. Um, but like even the back cover has some really cool graphic design. Uh, I'll show you that in a second. I will go ahead and read the synopsis from the back cover now. Andy is not a bedtime story. Andy is a novel that is so scary that you will want to stop reading, but you won't be able to. Andy is Jamie's friend. Jamie has left his dead mother in his old house and you have moved in. The old house has now become headquarters for all your fears. You know you should leave, but not before you're finished with Andy. And, uh, and there's the back. Uh, really kind of digging that formatting. Uh, pretty cool. So, um, so this book opens with a prologue uh, in which a poor little kid named Jamie uh, is being verbally and physically abused by his alcoholic mother. Now, his father, who was also an alcoholic, died a year ago, and ever since then, uh, his mother has just devolved to drink the juice and uh, just become mean as venom in the process. So, um, you know, all this little boy Jamie has in the whole world is his imaginary friend named Andy, uh, whom uh, he calls on to protect him while his detested mother is, uh, you know, just slapping the living shit out of him. Now, uh, his mother tells him that he's too old to be having imaginary friends, uh, but Jamie insists that Andy is real. Now, uh, one night after his mother uh, kind of like uh, abuses him, uh, Jamie goes back into his his uh, bedroom, you know, uh, you know, very sad, and he finds uh, Andy just chilling on his bed, kind of smiling, his uh, unsettling smile with his tiny, sharp, pointed teeth, and um, Andy tells. Jamie to look at himself in the mirror. Take a good long look. And uh, Jamie looks and, and he sees the, uh, the angry red fingerprints uh, of his mother's hand left on his cheek, uh, which according to the author's description, make his skin look flayed open and exposed. And uh, of course, Andy isn't visible in the reflection, uh, but you know, Jamie looks and, um, and, and, and Andy says, you know, that, that outside uh, in the living room is not your real mother. Would your real mother, you know, behave this way toward you? Uh, your real mother died the day your father died. That woman uh, needs to be taken care of. You know, and, and Jamie says, well, well you know, what, what can I do? And, uh, and Andy reminds him, like, well, do you remember that hunting knife your father got you as a gift two years ago? He's like, well, why don't you uh, dig that out? You'll, you'll think of something. So, um... Yeah, uh, you know, Jamie voices some hesitation, but but uh, Andy reminds him, you know, that's that's not your mother. You know, you shouldn't do that. Now, in reality, um, the mother, uh, Jamie's mother, feels terrible about uh, how she's been treating her son. You know, the truth of the matter is that uh, she's been desolate ever since her husband died uh, from drowning a year ago, and uh, you know, she she fears that uh, you know if she isn't like overly protective of Jamie you know, she'll have nothing left at all. So, so this is why she, you know, she's so sort of like, uh, you know, overly protective and doesn't let him go out, doesn't let him have any friends, but she 
she resolves that night to sort of uh, try to make amends and, and, and treat her son better because she really does love her son. So so actually that, that night she, she goes up to his bedroom, she opens the door, kind of takes a peek inside, sees his uh, kind of curled form lying on the bed. And she comes, she goes up to him and kind of uh, brushes his hair and kind of whispers to him, uh, oh, Jamie, I, I really love you. And then suddenly, Jamie springs up uh, out of bed uh, and screams, I hate you, and then uh, whips out the knife, which, you know, Andy had uh, kind of suggested, and then plants it hilt deep in her temple, and then, uh, and then goes ahead and removes the knife and slashes it through her face, and... Uh, and goes about uh, just, you know, stabbing her. And, uh, you know, and the mother is so shocked and taken aback. She doesn't have time to utter any sound. Uh, no sounds are uttered other than the, uh, the bloody gurgling noises that are uh, kind of uh, pumping from her sliced throat. And uh, I will read to you guys the, the, the final two short uh, paragraphs of the prologue. It says, uh, The blade flashed through the air. Each new slash splattering blood on the bed, on the woman, on the boy. The ripping and puncturing sounds played like evil music in Jamie's ears, and a high-pitched maniacal laughter filled the room. So yeah, pretty uh, pretty gnarly start, right? Uh, then we start the uh, the novel proper uh, with a young man named Martin waking up. Uh, in uh, looking out the window of his store top apartment in uh, Toronto. And, uh, and he calls to his wife, uh, his sleeping wife, Anne, to wake up uh, to see something, uh, you know, outside the window that, that he that he is seeing. And Anne, you know, is, is then awoken and she's kind of grog she, uh, groggily wakes up. And uh, what she sees is actually not what her husband is seeing, but rather a hideous decomposed face hanging upside down, uh, staring at her. And uh, that's the uh, the first picture that I will show you guys. There's a there there is a there's an illustration of this event of the the mother or the woman Anne uh, waking up to find this hideous monster, and then and then suddenly the thing is straddling her and and raping her uh, in a scene that might make uh, Richard Lehman seem reserved and tasteful, and. Um, Clearly ends with her being seated by this monster, um, and then after it's all over, she asks the the creature, uh, "Why? Why? Why did you do that?" And the creature responds, saying, "You'll see, all in good time," and call him Andy. And then uh, the creature dissolves into the very air itself, disappearing. And the woman then kind of snaps out of it, seems to wake up. Uh, perhaps that was all just a terrible dream, right? Uh, so this this woman, Anne, and her husband, uh, Martin, have two kids. Uh, they've got eight-year-old Sean and a ten-year-old Jane. Now, uh, Martin is an academic. He's been looking for work uh, in the city, hasn't had any luck, uh, although he finally uh, has found uh, a position at a university in Newfoundland that his friend has uh, hooked him up with. And they're going to be moving uh, to Newfoundland to stay at a house that his friend is also sort of uh, letting them stay at that he has recently purchased. And uh, his uh, eight-year-old son, Sean, uh, does not like the, the fact that they are moving. He uh, has a bad feeling about it. In fact, uh, he's been having dreams of, uh, of, of moving down there. He has dreams of seeing uh, a creepy uh, person with sharp, pointy teeth uh, who keeps whispering his name. And, and the whispering gets louder and louder the closer to him he gets. And, and he tells his sister this. And his sister says, you're just, you know, having nightmares. It's, it means nothing. But, uh, but, but little Sean thinks, no, you know, this, this is... Uh, you know, portentous. Um, and he thinks that, uh, you know, this creature that he's been dreaming of uh, actually, you know, lives down in this place that his parents and, and them are moving to. So, uh, and as it turns out, Sean has a right to be apprehensive because uh, there is uh, there is actually a savage creature that's stalking the night forests of uh, Newfoundland and uh, hunting for prey uh, to slake its bloodlust. And, um, you know, and it's and its need for for flesh. So, uh, so the family, uh, this family, moves from their apartment in Toronto uh, down to uh, to to Newfoundland, and they're staying at this house, this house that a family friend has has uh, is is giving them in a very uh, like remote area with lots of hills and trees, and um, 
actually at one point after they move in, this friend that is giving them the house smells this awful stench, kind of like a, a black cloud, this noxious black cloud that makes him like run outside and puke. And then when he comes back in, he asks uh, his friends, um, uh, Martin and Anne, like, did you smell that, that, uh, that black cloud? And they look at him like he's crazy and say, no, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't smell anything. And, and as, as he's leaving, actually, he, he senses there's something evil about that house and, and that, uh, you know, he would be in danger if he ever returned to it. So uh, the first night that the family is in this new house in Newfoundland, little eight-year-old Sean is lying in bed, uh, unable to go to sleep. He's kind of fixated on the on the swirl of shadows playing on the, 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 the pale blue curtains of his bedroom. And uh, he notices it's a full moon and he thinks about werewolves and, and shivers. And then he thinks he hears a, a howling coming from outside. Uh, but then he realizes uh, that actually the sounds that he's hearing are, are possibly coming from inside the house. And, uh, and then he thinks that he hears like kind of a slithering uh, coming along the floor of his bedroom. And then before you kn he knows it, uh, there is uh, a creature, a red-eyed creature with sharp, needle-like white teeth uh, dripping with saliva. And the creature uh, grabs at him with its cold white hands and drags him under the bed. And uh, here's another uh, illustration I'll show you guys of this scene. Although, uh, for some reason in this picture, it looks like there's multiple creatures. I'm not sure, but a pretty cool uh, illustration nonetheless. And, um, and Sean's parents actually end up finding him curled in a fetal position under his bed, uh, just completely, almost, almost catatonic. And, and, you know, his skin is bone white. His thumb is clamped into his mouth. And actually, they can't get him to remove his, his thumb uh, from his mouth. Uh, eventually, his, his older sister coaxes him uh, to remove it. And they are all aghast uh, to see that he has actually gnawed his thumb down to a quote-unquote pulpy red stump, uh, leaving a, quote, raw mess that looked like the insides of a rare steak. And uh, meanwhile, copious amounts of blood are flowing down his cheek, quote, like lava bursting free from an angry volcano. So um, eventually, Sean's hand starts to heal, and uh, he claims that he doesn't remember anything that happened. Uh, neither does his sister. Uh, the, the parents just conclude it must have been a, just a terrible nightmare. You know, he's in a new, new surroundings, new house. Uh, however, uh, Sean refuses to sleep in that bedroom and, and asks to, to, you know, move downstairs from, from there on out. Uh, but, you know, gradually the family starts to acclimate to their new surroundings. Um, you know, the dad starts preparing for his new uh, university job. Uh, you know, both of the kids start to make new friends at school. Uh, but soon uh, more uh, ominous things happen, more portents uh, occur. Uh, the, the, the wife one day picks up the, the telephone, the ringing phone, uh, to hear a, a low guttural voice among the static warning her to, uh, to get out before it's too late. And, um, and meanwhile, during all of this, we get occasional uh, points of view of this nasty creature uh, roaming the forests outside, uh, which is uh, suddenly developing uh, brand new abilities. It's uh, uh, almost uh, developing things like uh, thought and reason uh, rather than just like the plain old animal instinct it, it usually has. And uh, it starts to crave a uh, human flesh again, uh, although it knows that it cannot have the, the boy, the, the boy that recently moved nearby, uh, because uh, the voice that uh, this voice that kind of uh, flies in the wind tells him that this boy must be uh, must be preserved. He will be taken, but he must be must must be kept must be kept alive. Uh, and whenever the creature uh, goes uh, to this house where this new uh, family, these new humans have moved into, he feels an odd familiarity uh, as if as if he knows that place, right? So uh, one night, uh, Sean uh, has his new best friend, Brian, uh, sleep over at his house. And, and Brian's all excited because Sean told him that he's living in a haunted house that's got like makes spooky sounds and is, is kind of weird. Uh, and they plan on sneaking out uh, of, of their uh, bedroom after Sean's parents go to bed to uh, go and scare uh, Sean's sister and uh, her girlfriends who are having a slumber party nearby. And so uh, they decide uh, after they do that that they are going to go to a place called the uh, the secret meeting place. And um, so 
first they they make it to the girl's house and uh, they meet up with some of the other friends from school and the other friends actually scare Brian uh, and, and then make fun of him for for being scared and and one of the boys says uh, who'd you think we were Jamie Robbins and then uh, and little Sean asks oh, who's Jamie Robbins and then and then they explain to him that uh, Jamie Robbins was a boy that actually lived in his house uh, before you know back a little while ago and that he was a kid uh, whose uh, father had died and, and whose mother went completely crazy and, and, and alcoholic and, uh, and uh, was super possessive and abusive toward him. And one day, uh, Jamie just snapped and, uh, and killed her and ate her and then disappeared into the woods. And then uh, ever since then, he's become some something of like a local legend. And uh, parents actually, uh, you know, use the story of Jamie Robbins to like, you know, tell their kids to stay out of the woods. Otherwise, they'll get uh, caught and eaten. And um, he's kind of become like the local uh, boogeyman. And, um, you know, Brian, uh, Jamie's friend, is very uncomfortable uh, during all this because he genuinely believes that it's real, that it's not just like a made up story. Um, and uh, they go, uh, at, they, the, all the friends then go to the secret meeting place that uh, Sean was talking about, that, that's oddly he knows about, even though, you know, he's recently moved there. And he takes them to this uh, this kind of hideaway spot, this really uh, cool spot with this, this flat topped rock. And there's a cave nearby. And he says that there's like inside that cave, there are these uh, strange markings and, um, you know, all the kids are like, how did the hell did you know about this place? You know, we've lived here our whole lives and we didn't know. And Sean says, I don't know. I just, I just knew. And, uh, and then out of the, uh, the cave emerges this, uh, terrifying creature, this creature with, with pointy teeth, which then dashes through the trees and, uh, and all the kids are, you know, freaked out. And then out of the, uh, the cave comes this really, uh, ominous, uh, kind of creepy sound. And, uh, and then the kids, uh, the, all the kids other than Sean, you know, start to sense that maybe, uh, whatever is in the cave is communicating with this other creature that dashed out of the cave and maybe also communicating a little bit with this, uh, this new kid, Sean as well. There's some sort of weird, there's something weird about this kid. And, uh, and, and as you know, it, uh, you know, Sean does soon start demonstrating some really, uh, strange, uh, dark sides to his personality, um, for instance, when his father takes him and his, his buddy Brian out fishing, uh, he feels a weird urge to uh, to eat the slimy worms that are used as bait. Uh, he also takes great delight in chopping off the uh, the heads of the fish that they uh, that they catch the and, and then uh, playing with their guts. Um, and then he also uh, starts to feel a weird desire for blood, like when he sees his father accidentally cut his finger. Uh, not to mention the fact that he's been sleeping in his clothes and his mom suspects that he's been sl sneaking out of the house at night and kind of roaming around the forests outside. What is all this? What's going on? Uh, could it be that Sean is is being possessed? Uh, will he succumb possibly to the same fate as uh, Jamie Robbins uh, who killed his, his mother and, and ran off? Uh, or maybe does he have something else in mind, uh, right? So um, uh, that that's all I'm, I'm going to say really about the plot. Uh, just know that in the end, uh, this book goes delightfully batshit crazy. I mean, I'm talking pure late 80s gold guano. I mean, we get shit like the requisite uh, dismemberments, uh, mutilations, <laughs> a wedding from hell. Uh, it's great. Um, so uh, yeah, so first off... Yeah, I have to just say that um, surprisingly, this book was uh, pretty creepy. Um, I mean, I was genuinely unsettled at times uh, while reading it, which which does not happen very often. You know, I read so many of these books, you get desensitized to that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, toward the second half of the book, it really goes to some outlandish, batshit places. Uh, for instance, uh, I, I'm always a fan, I've always been a fan of like dream sequences, like if they're executed well. I know that a lot of writers are, are taught, you know, if you go to creative writing workshops, so don't do dream sequences, but uh, but I, I think they're fun. But we, we, we get at one point a really uh, fun uh, dream sequence of, uh, of a little girl uh, kind of having the storybook wedding uh, that soon turns into a nightmare, literally. Um, yeah, I thought I thought it was really uh, well done, and you know, a lot of creativity and was on display there. Uh, but um, you know, this book uh, definitely not the most polished polished book. Although I am kind of surprised, uh, you know, that he couldn't that Bradley Snow couldn't find a publisher for it. I mean, I don't see why uh, an imprint like Zebra or even Onyx wouldn't have put this out. I mean. 
you know, like if, if our Patrick Gates's fear could find a, a home back then, I, I don't know why this couldn't. I, I, I might suspect that it could be the length of it because it is a relatively short book at only 200 pages. That's definitely too short for, uh, say, like an imprint like Leisure, you know, which at the time was uh, hell bent on putting out these, you know, 400 page like Stephen King like tomes all the time, hoping that they're going to like get a success because I guess that was popular to have like kind of epic books. But um, yeah, I, honestly, I don't know. It's, it seems interesting. Although I, I'm sure that if this had been picked up by sort of a, like a mainstream mid-list publisher, uh, it would have been edited down severely and it might have lost a lot of its uh, idiosyncratic charms if that if that were to happen. But um, one thing that is really clear uh, right away is that this dude, Bradley Snow, is a super horror fan. Uh, I mean, I don't know anything about this guy, but what I imagine is that he was like an uber horror nerd in the 80s, probably in high school, and, you know, was a, just went to all the horror movies, probably had a subscription to, to Fangoria and Gorezone and, uh, and just loved it and then decided in the late 80s that he was going to, you know, try to write his own horror novel and just kind of just tried to fill it with as much just crazy off the wall uh, ideas, you know, that that he could, um, you know. So that definitely feels like a like a kindred spirit. Now, you know, obviously not executed. Uh, perfectly. I mean, this is a, a pretty sloppy novel. Uh, I mean, it's clearly a first novel. It's very disjointed. Uh, you know, it doesn't know if it wants to be like a haunted house story, uh, a possession story, an evil kid story, a creature story. So it, it kind of just tries to blend them all together, uh, but not always in the most cohesive way. Uh, it could have used a proper editor. Uh, sometimes it's unclear like uh, what character is doing what, uh, or whose perspective we're in. Um, you know, sometimes the characters don't always interact very fluidly with each other. Uh, there is a scene uh, toward the end, a, a confrontation toward the end of the book between uh, the father, Marvin, Martin, and his friend who, uh, who gave them the house, which uh, was just so ineptly done that I literally was guffawing out loud as I read it. But, um, you know, that's not to say I didn't enjoy it. Um, however, uh, you got to say, I mean, this book definitely has spunk and it has energy. Uh, I mean, when it's hitting on all cylinders, it's uh, really, really engaging. In fact, uh, at times while reading this thing, I was reminded of how I, I felt when I was reading R. Patrick Gates for the first time. Um, it, it's got that same l level of energy and uh, like you know, d not caring about like, you know, going f and really going for it too, you know, really like bringing it, uh, bringing the horror. Uh, and also, like for a self-published horror novel, uh, the prose is surprisingly not bad, not not bad at all at times. It, it has some very effective imagery uh, in parts. I mean, uh, you know, sure, it it doesn't have like the copy editing. Like it could have it could have used a professional copy editor. There are mistakes here and there. Uh, sometimes like the wrong verb tense is used. But I mean, it's, it's not like too jarring or uh, you know like distracting. Nothing too egregious. But uh, but yeah, as far as the prose. Uh, it's kind of does what I really love when authors do. It, like the prose often has this sort of dreamy, like if, like otherworldly quality uh, to it. Um, it's got like that kind of. Uh, uh, it kind of almost reminds me at times of like Ramsey Campbell's prose, where like everyday objects can take on like surreal qualities. <laughs> Although of course, I mean, not nearly as polished as uh, Ramsey Campbell. But um, yeah, some really like cool imagery, slight, uh, unsettling at times. Like uh, here's a quote uh, describing how uh, the little boy, Sean, appears after being found, uh, you know, curled up under his bed after the monster attack. It says, quote, his eyes stared blankly at a spot on the curtains. They looked like they were inflamed pimples. And with the slightest pressure, the liquid from the eyeballs would pop, spraying its gooey fluid across the room. She took a step backward as if to avoid the inevitable bursting. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Or um, here's another quote, uh, another example of sort of like this kind of weird, uh, vivid, hallucinatory uh, freakiness uh, that, uh, that the author describes from this, um, you know, terrified child's point of view. So um, let me see. Let me find the page that this is on. Okay. It laughed in a way that chilled his blood. A fleeting vision of tiny cubes of ice floating in a blood-red river flashed through his mind. 
Suddenly, a hand exploded from the river, shedding streams of purple-red waterfalls dripping soundlessly back from where it came. The hand expanded, exposing massive greenish sores. The skin of the middle finger cracked and split apart. The pulpy flesh pulsated. Slowly, the raw flesh ripped further apart, bearing the white of the bone. An eye winked to life from the bone and was looking at him. Rich shook his head wildly, trying to shake the image from his, eye, from his head. The eye and the finger squinted. The flesh in the palm of the hand bulged. The skin started to bubble like lava. Teeth ate their way out from the depths of the now monstrous hand. A swollen tongue covered with tiny insects rocketed out, and after reaching its limit, rolled back into the mouth that was now fully formed in the palm of the hand. The eye widened. Scarlet canals weaved their way through the whites in constant motion. He saw his own face reflected in the black pupil. His image was screaming. So, um, yeah, that's pretty cool imagery, right? Um, pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, we also get some nice moments of gore, um, you know, very visual and graphic. Uh, really, really dug the way it was written. Uh, I also enjoyed the occasional uh, POV of the, the, this creature kind of stalking the forest uh, at night. Uh, and it's kind of like the way it uh, describes the, the developing cravings of the creature, uh, you know, craving uh, these uh, other creatures that dwelled in the houses, according to it. And, um, you know, again, I also just really appreciated the artwork uh, that is sprinkled throughout this book. Uh, you know, I mean, he didn't need to, like, go that far and include that. But uh, it just shows, you know, the, the, the passion that, that he had, you know, like putting out his first uh, horror novel. He, he, he really went all out. And, um, you know, we definitely would not have gotten that um, if, if, uh, if it had been published by a main, mainstream publisher. We wouldn't have gotten stuff like... Um, like like this, for example. Like I mean, that's just freaking awesome, right? Definitely. And actually, that's a picture I think of of the scene I had just read. So um, yeah, really quite. Cool. You know what? I mean, for all its flaws, I, I kind of loved this odd, spooky, uh, quirky little book. I, I feel like uh, you know, this is a super obscure one that um, you know, you don't hear much uh, talk about. But um, yeah, really, really cool, and and I think you know just an auspicious start uh, to the new decade and uh, to the 2020 year in reading. So I'm happy to have this uh, you know be my first book review of 2020. Uh, I say if you guys uh, come across it for a decent price, uh, check it out. Uh, it is definitely uh, you know worth checking out. It's, it's super short too, 200 pages. So uh, yeah, that is it, guys. That is Andy by Bradley Snow. Hope you enjoyed the review. Uh, if any of you guys have read that book or or his other books, uh, he has you know he took a long break after publishing this one, but then he recently, I think like in the in the aughts, uh, started publishing again, and he has a couple of of, of self published books also. <laughs> he still can't get published by the the, the, the mainstream publishers, but uh, I would be curious to check those out. And if any of you have read it, any of those, uh, definitely drop a line and let me know. But uh, yes, thank you guys for watching. Uh, check back soon for more uh, fun horror book reviews in 2020. I will see you later. Peace out.